as we wrap up, I wanted to um, get thoughts from you guys on a current affair or a recent affair that's come up on the MiG-23. Now, of course, none of us are in the cockpit. Everybody has their opinions and everybody thinks they know everything about it. But I just thought it'd be a great conversation for you two guys because you've you've flown these type of aircraft with ejection seats and all that kind of stuff. And I have had now a few people here at the airport ask me to ask you two guys um, your thoughts on that whole M that MiG-23. I thought it'd just be a good conversation. Maybe we can all learn something from your thoughts and experiences. One thing I didn't know is you know, if one pulls, they're both going. I'd love to get thoughts from you guys on, and of course, we're just sharing our opinions and having a conversation here. Yeah, Rain. Well, Pete, I was thinking since the MiG-23 is probably closest to the performance capabilities of a Hornet, then maybe you should take it, and then I can jump in here. But <laughs> <laughs> I, see I was what waiting you did for that. <laughs> Bam! Yeah, I got him. <laughs> I would. Uh, I'd relate it more to the big fighter. The Tomcat? Yeah, it's, you know? that's, yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, hey, that's my favorite. Wings, <laughs> the little swept wings. Um, no, I think, well, you know, one, I, I, I haven't looked at the NTSB report, Pete. I don't know if you've done it same. yet or not. I can say that no one wants to eject just to eject, so I guarantee these guys didn't do that uh, just because they thought it would be fun. And you're not going to get out of an aircraft. And they were in, I mean, looking at the video, they're, they're doing an air show, right? So you're low anyways. Min controlled ejection altitude in the F-16 and most uh, ACES-2 is 2,000 feet. AGL uncontrolled 6,000 feet, meaning that if you're controlled, like, hey, I lost my motor, I'm not going to make it to the runway, you can work the problem to 2,000 feet, and then you need to get out of the jet. If you're in a spin and you're not able to get the jet under control, when you see 6,000 feet AGL, you get, you got to jump out of the jet. So they're already down low to the ground. They're not out of control. I don't know if it was hydraulics. The you know, thing froze. I don't know the characteristics of the MiG-23 engine failure, et cetera. You guys might know more there. But obviously, they have hung with this thing as, probably as long as humanly possible based on just watching the video um, with that. I don't know if it had an inner seat sequencer if the MiG-23 had it. I don't know what seats are in it. So there are... Um, you know, most of our jets flying around the inventory have a seat sequencer. There are some that don't, or you might have a, a mode selector, meaning that you can put it in both. When the whoever pulls the handle, the back seat's usually going first in the front seat. Most jets, you can put in solo, meaning if you pull the handle, only you are the one who's going to go for the rocket ride. Uh, I don't know what the configuration of the Big Twenty Three uh, was in that case, but looking at it, you know, it looked like it was in a bank descending. There was not, a, it didn't look like the wings were way out. So I'm assuming again, a low energy state, very low maneuverability that they're going to have available to them. And again, this is all hypothetical from me watching social media. So uh, feel free to shoot holes in this, but those guys probably did not have a lot of options, nor you know, no one wants to eject that guy. It's a privately owned MiG-23, makes money flying that thing. So he wants to do it. I can say, uh, Feed probably can speak to the Hornet that crashed, uh, gosh, man, that's probably a decade ago into San Diego, into the neighborhood. Yep. But it's something that, as a pilot, you're cognizant of. Uh, it's something I always thought about. You do monthly emergency procedure trainings in the sim. If you were ever going to lose the jet, if you're able to give it a point away from a crowded, uh, you know, populated area, et cetera, no pilot wants to kill people on the ground when they eject from the, the jet. So Amen to that. I think I think I think it is something that's like probably a baseline assumption that you're gonna do whatever you can humanly possible to the last possible second uh, to not injure or harm anyone on the ground. So uh, I do not envy the situation those guys were in. I'm glad the seats work and I'm obviously incredibly uh, glad and we're very fortunate that no one on the ground was hurt. But those guys are trying to solve a complex problem with not a whole lot of uh, solutions and options available to them. Yeah, it's very easy to, to armchair quarterback a situation uh, zero knots of the meter at 1G. There's, we're sitting here talking right now. So uh, just like what Rain said, speculation is going to go all over the place. And best thing we can do as aviators and as pilots, no matter what we fly, is to give those air crew the benefit of the doubt that they made the best decision that they possibly could with the information that they were handed at the time. Now, when you're used to flying, one quick thing I wanted to point out what Rain said, and for our listeners, think about this at the airport that you fly at, 
I'm going to say, I'm going to say this question. And when you watch this video, I want you to think about this. Tell me what your field elevation is of your home airport right now. So if you had to think about it, if you had to think about it now, think about what rain just said, he said 2000 feet AGL or 6,000 feet AGL. Now think about, put yourself in those shoes. You are out of control. <laughs> You're in a spin. And now you have to do mental math of what the AGL altitude is to equal 6,000 feet above your terrain while you're spinning out of control with an engine that's about either gone and now you're thinking about how to get out of this jet. So think about those things where you're like, holy cow, that is a lot of stuff that's going on right now to be like, if you picture the first the first Top Gun, 7,000, 6,000, right? That's just sitting there looking at the meter, not thinking AGL altitude that you're like, oh man, like feel elevation out in Fallon's over 4,000 feet. If you see 6,000 feet on the meter, you're, man, it's, it's going to be a tough day, you know? So yep. sit there and think about what the AGL altitudes equal. Now, as a guy that has flown feet above the ground at just under uh, the speed of sound multiple times and doing those things, I'm constantly thinking about that and having lost a lot of friends in the aviation business, military and civilian, that's exactly what Rain is talking about to be like, no pilot. And I know our listeners are thinking the same thing. You would never want to be responsible for doing something that would take somebody else's life. It just is not something that goes through our mind. And so we think about it to, hey, point away, get as slow and as high as you can and make sure that's it's a it's not a primary, but it's definitely a goal if you can to think to get that airplane away from the ground and away from harm if you need to jettison the training aid, as we like to call it in the Navy. So you think about those things, but sometimes in an arena where you take maybe in a Blue Angel situation or you take in an air combat situation where you fly through something and you completely lose control of the airplane and it snaps and skids turn stalls, you're now out of control of that airplane and you are no longer in control. So you can't make decisions other than what is my altitude? Can I stop what's happening right now? If not, I got to get out. That's a totally different situation. So looking at that video of what these so guys went that. through, yeah. don't know what they were dealt with in the cockpit. They may have some indications that was telling them something, just like what Rain said. Yes, the Hornet, we do have a selector mode. One of the scariest things that I would do as number seven would put somebody in the back seat and be like, hey, look, and if it's black and yellow, it's a party handle, don't touch it. <laughs> and I really <laughs> hope. I would really hope that uh, they would understand what that means after I would point out in every single portion of the cockpit to be like, don't touch that, don't touch that, don't touch that, all right? And I would fly around in what's called solo mode as Blue Angel 7 because if they punched, they would go and I would bring a convertible back to the airport and be like, they're somewhere <laughs> over there. <laughs> Let's go find them, you know? But it is, uh, it is a real thing. And just like what Rain said, the last thing they want to do is try and get out of the airplane. Now, if let's say the plane was working, everything was fine, and there was a miscommunication in the cockpit, and if it's true, don't know, not speculating, but let's just say that the backseater saw something that the pilot maybe was not seeing, and he decided to save the day, he or she decided to save the day and get out of the cockpit, that's another conversation. But that comes back to the brief, where if you're in a multi-crew cockpit, you talk about all the emergencies, like what Rain said. You say, hey, look, in an emergency situation, if we need to get out of the airplane, unless I am incapacitated or something along those lines, as the pilot command, I will be the one to get us out of the airplane. Unless you see a situation that is un unable to communicate to me that you see impending danger, unless you make a decision right now, let me be the one to pull the handle. Now, that stuff... I mean, we could peel this onion back for weeks and weeks and weeks and never get to the bottom of it. Yeah, that's the briefing we do in this. It's part of my briefing. Oh. If that canopy comes off and you don't hear me say eject, that means either I'm already gone and you better get out or I'm incapacitated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Where, where's Team Brian? Oh, he's back there under shoot. <laughs> <It's just laughs> yeah, see, yeah. see the skydiver? It's a guy flying. Well, I guess yeah, I should so I, do something. Yeah, I, I guess the question actually should be different for you guys, because you guys combined have flown more air shows combined than probably most of the people on the planet. Well, you have more than most of the people on the planet. So are there things that you guys do brief talk about being in the position that you guys have flown 
in air shows, it's like, well, my first priority is get it away from the crowd, point it to somewhere where nobody's going to get hurt. Or do you guys think differently in that scenario? Like, how do you get to that point? Mine was pretty easy because I'm single ship. I'll let feed probably dig more in the weeds on this, right? But they're, you know, all the air show is designed to have minimize or completely eliminate energy directed at the crowd. There are some maneuvers in the F-16 air show profile that, you know, undoubtedly doing a min radius turn on the back three quarter of that, like your velocity vector, your lift vector is pushing towards the crowd. So, you know, if you punch out instantaneous air, the jet is still moving that direction. But you would you would practice in the sim. You would practice in the initial phases of training in the jet, aborting in a maneuver, simulating an engine failure, et cetera. But again, like for the vast majority of the F-16 profile, the, the energy, there's no energy that's going towards the crowd. Or if you're pointed at the crowd, you're going so fast that if you do take a bird and the motor shells itself, you're doing 500 knots. You're just going to zoom it, get, continue straight over the crowd and end up in you know a field somewhere where you punch out. But you're absolutely thinking about that. And that's why the profiles are designed that way. And unfortunately, it's been learned through many, many mishaps in air shows with having energy going towards the crowd. The Reno air races, uh, I guess that's yeah. probably now 13 years ago. You know, now it's all moved away. And while this is the last Reno air race in Reno, hopefully it moves somewhere else. But that energy uh, is something you definitely have to consider where, where the plane is going at all times. Yep, exactly. And so energy directed to the crowd assumes that there's a primary viewing area. Well, sometimes it gets a little challenging, like for us in San Francisco, there's crowd everywhere. Yep. So there is an assumed level of risk that can be mitigated via CRM and ORM matrix that we look at it and go, okay, what show are we doing? what dangers do we have? We've got the Golden Gate Bridge right here. We've got the Bay Bridge right here. We've got Alcatraz. We've got the entire downtown of San Francisco right there. Everything is a factor. We've got boats. We've got sailboats with mast speed. You're going to be going down in the water, 10 feet off the water or so at <laughs> 0.99. I mean, sitting there. So everything is a factor, right? So you look at it just like what Rain said, speed is life. So if you're going, you know, 600 knots, boom, I feel something. All I got to do is pull away from the ground and just get away and look at it and be like, all right, let me get, you know, airspeed. Let me get some airspeed, you know, let me get some altitude below the wings. You know, let's figure out what's going on and let's talk about it. Whereas the assumed level of risk, like what Rain is talking about, when you're going through that min radius turn, there is a point to where the energy is directed at that primary viewing area where like San Francisco, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a elevated safety you know, conscious show that we think about because the Blues launch from Oakland and they go all the way over to the San Francisco Bay, do the show there, and then have to come all the way back to Oakland. But for us, unlike a baby little Viper, we take traps like it's our job. So we put the hook down, we take a trap, and we're like, cool, sweet, put the hook up, we go back, park the jet, turn the engines off, we're fine. Or they put range jet in the trash and they're like, cool, that was fun, <laughs> let's go do it again. For us, it's dangerous because we've got Oakland here, we've got the air show up here and then Moffett airfield down to the Southwest where our resting gear is. When you think about a typical show site with a primary viewing area like Jacksonville or like Pensacola or you know any typical air show, we land with min fuel when we take off at that runway, do the show and land. So when now you take, okay, now we're triangulating where we have to fly. So now we have to fly a safety mitigated fuel profile risk because now we're sitting there going, man, it's 30 miles to the show box. It's 30 miles back, plus another about 15 miles through very congested airspace if we have to take a trap. So you have to think about all that stuff. And you're like, the last thing we want to do is put a blue jet somewhere in San Francisco because that will not go over well because there's no safe place to put the airplane unless you want to go into the water. So every show site's different where, you know, you're flying Chicago, you got water here, and then you have buildings right there off the show site. So what, where's the primary viewing area? Is it, is it 70 feet, 200, 500 feet above you from people looking at the masts, you know, of the top of the skyscrapers looking down at the show? I mean, so there's all these things that go on that's continuously updated. That's a big point to point out. Just because you talked about it in the brief doesn't mean it's not going to change in the flight. So you said, cool, there's our assumed level of risk. Now we are continuously calculating and updating our decision matrix as the flight goes on. Awesome. 
Well, I know you guys are busy. You're flying all over the world and having babies and a lot of stuff going on, but I appreciate you jumping on. And these are some good questions that came in from the members and uh, thank you guys for, for doing this. And I know we got a whole bunch of questions coming up and we'll get these scheduled for uh, all you guys out there in E3. And uh, anything you guys want to wrap with? No, thanks for having us, Brian, putting this together. It's good to reconnect with the E3 members. We've got more stuff coming down the pipe. I'm excited. So it's fun to have feed as, you know, integral part of the team officially although he's been around since day one so this is cool i'm excited <laughs> yeah right back at you guys brian this is always awesome to be a part of this uh thanks for the invite once again e3 members out there hopefully you guys enjoyed this please send the feedback to us if uh, there's something else you wanted to see let us know because we're continuously updating we're growing together as a family hopefully you guys know about the event that's coming up here uh out towards the west out in the grand canyon area let us know if you want to be a part of that as well brian's a man yeah but uh feed's checking out Peace. Thanks, Brian. Hey, guys.